Be Your Best You, the Passionate to Purpose podcast with David Delaney. Good morning and welcome to this, the Be Your Best You, Passion into Purpose podcast, where this morning we talk to David Butler. David is an animator and illustrator, originally from County Kildare in Ireland. He now lives in Port Arlington, County Leash, also in Ireland. David is a graduate um, of the animation production side of things at the Dunleary Film Institute of Ireland, and he has worked on several award-winning projects, including the BAFTA award-winning Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. We talked to David about his current projects and why he does the work that he does. Good morning, David Butler. Morning, Dave. How are you, sir? All is good. All is good on this beautiful spring morning in County Leash. Uh, good, good to see you. Good to have you here. Oh, cheers. Yeah, it's good, good to chat to you. It's been a while, a couple absolutely. of months since I was talking to you last. Absolutely. I, I have a very, very important question, and I, I hope you forgive me for starting with such a, I suppose, a, a strong, and but it's a question that I, I do need answered, and it's, do fish wear pyjamas? Oh, Dave, you're also hitting me with one there. Look. All, what I say to people is, you have to read the book, man. <laughs> you have to okay, read the book. Right. Well, let's 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 start there, right? Do fish wear pajamas? I was doing research. I was telling you, you know, that that's an actual brilliant title for for anything. Um, tell me, tell me about do fish wear pajamas? Where 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 is it? What is it? How is it? Why is it? Yeah, listen, that was the that was the thing that kicked all this off. Um, yeah, so do fish wear pajamas was um a title of a book that I did with a friend of mine called Mario Kurgan, and believe it, it's actually a good thing to start out with because it's actually what kicked kind of everything that I've done off. Um, so, uh, back in twenty ten, I had a painting exhibition in the Derby Festival in Kildare Town. I'm a Kildare Town man by. Uh, by design, by the way, I'm originally from Kildare. Um, so I had a painted exhibition in, in um, Derby Festival in Kildare Town and another artist friend of mine called Eamon Ellers, two of us were on it. And uh, for, um, a guy called Mario Corrigan, who's a Kildare librarian. And uh, Mario came to launch the exhibition for the Derby Festival. Uh, the county arts officer wasn't available for this particular event. So Mario came along. And uh, I'd kind of known Mario. Mario uh, plays bass in a few bands, and I'd uh, met him through friends of friends a few times and that. But I, I, I wouldn't. We we exchanged numbers and stuff like that. But I, like we weren't mad uh, close or anything like that. We're just kind of acquaintances, distant acquaintances. And uh, so Mario, we're going around the exhibition and. Uh, Mario was talking about the other artist, Eamon Ellers, and he's amazing, real, all Star Wars, all film, Indiana Jones, and all this sort of stuff. Uh, very creative guy. I'm still working with him. He's helping us out in Celticon, doing a few bits, actually, just as we speak. Um, but, um, yeah, Mario was kind of looking at all my stuff, and my background's in animation, so I have this kind of cartoony style, this kind of uh, child-friendly, if you like, Um kind of style to my artwork and look at no matter what I do it's kind of ingrained me at this stage uh, and uh, so Mario said said to me look I have this idea for a book would you be interested in illustrating it and I was chatting away whatever yeah no hassle so um, about six months later I was in work one day and I got this missed call from Mario and uh, so where I was working at the time I was in an office so I couldn't really take the call there so I went out in the corridor and uh, had a chat with Mario, rang him back, and uh, he says, uh, do you remember that project you said you were interested in? And I was like, all right, come on, uh, what did I sign up to, you know? Uh, so I said, look, I have this idea for a children's book. Uh, and I said, look, yeah, I love the idea. I've never done one before, but I absolutely love the idea of a chance to get working on something like that. And I said to him, one condition. And he goes to me, what's that? And I says, I don't want to illustrate a book that's going to be stapled together or put in a drawer somewhere that no one's ever going to see. I said, I want this book to look like it should be on the shelf. It could it could fit on the shelf in between Harry Potter and 
Roald Dahl and all those sort of stuff and the um Oshin McGann's books and all that. I said, look, I I, I want the book. Look, I, I don't know how we're gonna do it, but that's the thing. And he said, right, we'll we'll try our best. So he went off then and got some money from Clare County Council initially from the uh, Arts Act grant and the uh, kind of library service in Clare because he that's his job and um all that sort of stuff. Um and they came back with this great idea. So what Do Fisher of Barjamas actually was, was Mario had the title and he had one character's name called Bebob, Zibbly Bob. And he went into kids in primary school in third class in Kildare Town. And there was two boys classes and two girls classes. And he workshopped through the kids this story, uh, kind of using the local mythology and kind of um, with some local historical buildings like the Kildare Cathedral and stuff like that. And he's, he uh, made this kind of workshop through the kids, this story. Uh, so that's kind of how all that happened. Um, yeah, so I, I got given this, sent this book, uh, this email came across and I just loved it. Uh, it was all set in Kildare Town. I kind of knew bits and pieces. I was actually learning some of the historical stuff. Um, like the, the there's a grey and a black abbey and a white abbey. And I was like, Never knew anything to that. I knew a grey abbey. Uh, there's a vest there across from Aldi. Actually, Aldi wasn't there at the time and um, when we we're doing this book. But uh, yeah, I kind of, I learned bits and pieces from it. And so is, is that your process? Do you, do you get, when, when, you're, when you're writing a book, when you're working on a book, do you, when you're collaborating, because I know you've done a few collaborations as well, um, do, you, do you get the material or like, what, what's... What's the main process? Do you work off something that someone else has kind of given you the, the bones for, or do you come up with the whole thing yourself? Tell me a bit about the, the process behind that. Breaking up there, Dave. I don't know if you can hear me. Sorry there, no. Um, yeah. uh, I'm good now. Uh, yes. Yeah. You got the question. Yeah, so you get there from it. Oh, it looks, looks like the unstable, unstability of the internet's on my end. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> So listen, yeah. So they, I, I get the email. What, what I say to kids when I go, when I go into schools and do workshops and libraries and stuff, I say, look, the the difference between an illustrator and a reader isn't that different at the beginning because we are just given the book, um, and if you read a book and imagery comes to your head, and the good books do that, and uh, as you're reading stuff, they get inside your head and create the images and create the world as you're reading a book and all illustrators do is just take those images and try and create illustrations from them um so the only the only kind of thing we would have is we would have the book in advance um and uh yeah actually do do fish wear pajamas i absolutely hadn't a clue what to do uh had to figure it all out and sometimes that's the best way just jump into the deep end and learn how to, how to get the far side of it, you know. Um, I was actually chatting to a friend of mine recently. He did a, uh, interviewed me for a college project. And I suppose the big thing that I kind of have is I get these ideas and I get these projects and I, I do them. But the thing about me is I, I actually carry them through. And I think that's my biggest strength. I don't just talk about these things. I try my best like I don't always succeed Um, I'd, I'd like to think I've reasonably successful or I've done a good job of the stuff that I've done in the past but in general like I I kind of get asked to these things and I, I suppose from having the animation and that sort of background um, I kind of get asked to do different things and I'm that kind of artist guy right. and sometimes it's the only artist guy that people know and that's kind of how I got initially how I would have got stuff you know there's, there's a, a history theme I suppose running through some of your work as well I mean you Shackleton was, was another um, another book, book you you worked on and is, is there are there similarities say with the journey like Shackleton great explorer do you compare yourself in, in some sense to being an explorer as well like do you explore the world that you like do you, do you immerse yourself to in order to produce the work or do you do you treat it like a job? I'm, I'm doing this. I need to figure this out. Or do you actually go full on, immerse, and I'm going to go on this journey? Like, oh, how yeah. creative, I suppose, is, is the process for you? No, you, you've hit the nail on the head with that. Uh, no, it absolutely isn't a, an adventure. It isn't a journey. Um, 
and you do immerse yourself in the world, whether it's through books, through documentaries, through the research that you do. Um, yeah, I suppose actually the the shackling is actually linked to do fish wear pajamas as well. So you have just absolutely hit the nail on the head there. So what how we launched uh, the book of do fish wear pajamas was through a a, a festival in Calaire Town called One Book One Town. So the idea was all the schools would read a certain book, and they would they would all have this kind of little festival, a little kind of get together, having read the book. All the all the primary schools, by the way. Um, so that particular year, the guys read um, Michael Smith, who's a Shackleton author. Uh, they read his book, uh, Tom Crean, the Iceman. And we were all invited to the launch because we were launching our Do Fish Your Pajamas and we had the launch at the festival and we all went for lunch in the Silicon Thomas in Calair Town. And uh, I was having lunch with Michael Smith and there's a few others there, a few school teachers and my old school principal and things like that. And Mario was there as well. And I was sitting with Michael Smith and everyone was asking, oh, how about all this about Tom Crean and all this about Shacklin? And I hadn't a clue. I thought Shacklin was British. Uh, I knew he was an explorer. I knew of Tom Crean. I, I knew he was a cool guy. I, I kind of knew him from the Guinness ads years and years ago and uh, those iconic images and stuff like that. But I, I didn't know an awful lot about it. Um, so sitting there with lunch, all these people asking questions with Michael Smith and they're, they're all really energetic and all. And like, I hadn't a clue. <laughs> uh, so I said to myself, if I ever meet Michael Smith again, I am going to read his books before I ever meet him again. And my God, when I read his books, I was absolutely blown away. Um, these I couldn't believe there's this Calairborn Antarctic explorer that I knew very little about. So I got all excited about it. So I knew nothing about him. Everyone needs to know about him, and that was the kind of journey for that. Um, so we actually did a, a little project in uh, Castle Dermot, a school in Castle Dermot with a Thai library. I know you worked in a Thai for a while there. Uh, so we did a little book on Shackland. So the, the guys in Castle Dermot did a project on their local hero. So they picked Shackland and they picked Michael Smith's book on Shackleton. It's called The Boss, or Shackleton and the Boss. Um, so they picked that book and they want to do a, a little kind of illustration project or uh, thing with it. And I was like, okay, this book is already illustrated. Like, why are we illustrating a book that's already illustrated? And I said, look, why don't we do a comic book version of it? And uh, so the guys in the library um, got really excited about that. And so I went in the school, Castle Dermot, with the book. The kids had all were reading the book, uh, Shackle and the Boss. And um, a teacher in the class, a guy called Owen Kirk, uh, said to me about the James Caird journey. And he said, it's the most amazing boat journey, journey in Antarctic or sea history. And it's kind of skipped over in the Shackle story. And the reason it's skipped over is because there's no photographs of it. So there's these amazing photographs of Tom Crean and the boat stuck in the ice and all these uh, iconic images of the, of the endurance expedition, but there's none of the actual James Caird. And that sparked the idea. So there's kind of four chapters in Michael Smith's book and there was four tables that I was dealing with. So we said, right, that's the version we're going to do. We're going to do the James Caird and we're going to have each table work on the chapter of the book. So they were to break it down and illustrate, do their version, the little kids comic book version of the James Caird through the four chapters. So I was doing, I was doing this process and I, I found this with uh, primary school kids. Uh, they're great, by the way, they've great imaginations and great whatever. But I found a thing where... There's these kids that are really good at art. And what was happening was everybody else was doing what that kid was doing at the table. So the kid would do a really good picture of a ship. And next to me, you have four copies of this exact same picture on the table. I said, right, OK, we're not going to get through this four chapters. 
So I went off, I, I got my notebook out and I broke down the story as I would through illustrating. Uh, so you do these kind of little thumbnail sketches. Um, and it's an animation thing as well. We do it all the time. Uh, so I would visually break down the story in these little tiny sketches. And so I worked out all of the, the four chapters of what we're doing. And I kind of give the kids a little kind of um, the animation skills that we do. So basically, when you look at each character, each one has a unique uh, design to it, um, little design elements to it. And uh, you'd see it all the time. You, you just wouldn't really know. It. So if, you, if, if you've if you seen all the Simpsons lining up, standing up, you, you would know by the silhouette that that's Homer, that's Marge, that's Lisa, that's Bart. You, you, you'd you know those shapes. So I, I kind of did that sort of thing uh, with the different characters. And um, little did I know, I was actually doing all the pre-prep for what I needed for my own book. So um, around that time as well, I was working with a friend of mine called Gavin McComiskey. And uh, Gavin was self-publishing his own comic books. And we uh, call Innocent Tales. Gavin's um, a loud man, but he's from loud, not loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, he is loud as well, uh, but uh, no, he's from loud. Um, Dundalk, so, and he, he's uh, living in Tullamore. So that's kind of got in touch with Gavin. And so I was, we we're looking at projects to work on um, after doing the, the short comics. So he, he would give me stories, like four page stories, and uh, I think some of them were eight pages, uh, eight pages long. And we're coming up with different ideas and look, what about this? What about that? Yeah. And Shackling was just rising uh, in my mind. And it was coming up to the centenary of uh, the 100 year anniversary of the James Caird as well. So all these things were all happening. So we decided to do a few book pitches and uh, send off to publishers and see what happens. So um, after a few initial rejections, um, I got some great advice actually from one publisher who decided not to go with it. Uh, well, people, well, people don't realize as well that this stuff is kind of a, it's like a business as well, you know? Um, so it, it's not that, um, it's not that they don't like your idea or they don't like your thing it's just like it's not commercial enough it's not uh it's yeah. not hit, hitting the mark so is, is that hard for you as a creative to get that um rejection it is and um well i've kind because i did animation and i've i've gone through that process and we've had tv series ideas that didn't go ahead and i the uh, short films and stuff um yeah, it's just part of it. And uh, so, so the biggest biggest thing about filmmaking or animation or anything like that is getting f films uh, funded. Uh, creating them and getting the people is the kind of easy part. It's actually getting the money to make them is the hardest part. You, and, you've worked on you've worked with Channel Four, like you you worked on Sir Gawain. Yeah, so we we did a uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, yeah, so I was quite lucky with that. So we actually won a BAFTA award for that project back in 2002. And uh, ironically, I actually haven't worked full time in animation since that. Um, but that's just part of life, you know, like yeah. things change. And uh, yeah, so we, I did I did two kind of animation series and uh, a short film. So so the, the Sir Gawain the Green Knight was 25 minutes long, uh, which is an episode of kids animation now but at the time it was all hand drawn and it was a massive massive ordeal so kind of animation projects that length were actually considered feature films and um, so when we go to film festivals we were under the feature film uh, category because we were over like 15 minutes um so that was kind of a bit mad but uh yeah we actually won a tv bafta in 2002 and i described the things we, we got nominated and uh, the producers now were talking to us and I said, look, Agwash, look, bring your family with you. We're not going to win it. Bring your family over, make a weekend of it and do whatever. And I remember being in my desk at home, uh, we we're living in the house at the time and I was like drawn, of course, of course I was drawn at uh, 10 o'clock on a Sunday night um, and I get this phone call 
say that we won and I was just couldn't believe it. It was absolutely just nuts, like, you know. Um, and uh, the very next day, I was actually going into an evening shift in work and uh, I work in Pfizer and Newbridge and I was heading in on that. Wasn't long there at the time. And uh, I got the phone call on a bus to say there was a party on that night. And I was like, oh, I'm going into work. <laughs> and uh, I, the situation in work was I wasn't, I was only in that particular, I got moved in the area. So I was in that particular area and I was only there for a week or two. And I hadn't quite scoped out what the crack was, you know. So I went into work and I still to this day, man, regret it because I, I missed the whole buzz of that. So you were sitting there in, in work. Uh, BAFTA award winning and then later and you're just going to the go doing the job like yeah I look it, it was the project of one so we won yeah. best we won best animation uh so it's the project of one it wasn't me personally you know um how, how much work like when we see 25 minutes on screen I, I think uh, as well it's modern world which I'll talk to you about in a second well. um when we see 25 minutes in in terms of days weeks months years what's what's in 25 minutes in terms of the, the workload well, 25 minutes back then, it was a hand-drawn animation. Uh, so we we actually drew that in pencil and inked and pen and marker. And it's absolutely nuts. People do, people just wouldn't do this stuff now. So the actual film that we did, and I, I actually think kind of the selling point of it is we did it to look like stained glass windows. Uh, and that was the unique look we had to it. Um, so we had like the... This wasn't my idea, by the way, and I, I'm not taking credit for this, but the, the team came up with this idea of a uh, stained glass artist called Harry Clark, who's an Irish illustrator, um, back back in the 1920s or whatever, famous for all these churches, and he would have done Bewley's Cafe, and yeah. uh, he's, he's loads of work all over the place. Um, and he died quite young, and he, he illustrated some amazing uh, Hans Christian Andersen and all these books. I don't know how that look you're talking about me. I, I don't know how this guy did it back then. But uh yeah, Harry Clark was the inspiration. So we used his kind of designs and um we did an animated version of it. And uh we had these big black like lead lines that you'd see in stained glass windows. And I think it just gave the whole film a whole different look. Uh so to explain the animation process, so animation is like um, 25 frames per second for video or 24 on film. Um, but that actually makes a big difference if you're working on film and digital. Uh, but in in animation, in terms of frame, like in computer animation, it doesn't matter because that's all, you just render it out. Uh, for hand drawn, it does. Um, so feature film, like Disney films, they would all be on ones. So they would do a drawn for drawn of movement for every one frame. And that's feature films. Uh, TV would do for two. They would do one drawn for two frame. And that's just costing. Uh, it's cheaper to do half the work. Uh, and that's where you'd see. You don't, you don't really see the big difference now in digital stuff, but Back in the 90s, if you looked at those TV series and feature films, there's a massive, massive difference. Um, and that's why the likes of Disney and stuff kind of stayed away from big TV shows and stuff because the quality wasn't there, you know. Um, but no, we actually did ours on trees because of the soil and we slowed it down a little tiny bit. Um, and every now and again, we'd freeze the frame and we'd, we'd do the lips on ones. Um, and uh, so that's that's kind of how we work. So to answer your question, it, it took two years to make a 25 minute film. Um, I worked on it for kind of a year to a year, three months, four months, that kind of timeline. Uh, you, you say just, you say to me that the, the illustrator and the reader isn't that different. And I'm, I'm just I'm curious. And you mentioned the work you do with the primary school kids and, and the four tables and all the rest. You were a primary school kid. I'm curious to know, uh, seven, eight year old David Butler. Um, were you, were you like, where, where did, where did this creativity come from? Um, I have a theory, and it's not proven. Okay. Uh, and I've been saying this, and it's becoming more relevant. And I do think there's something in it. I think myself to some kind of uh, 
autism traits to my personality. I, I honestly believe that. And I've okay. said it because I, I've always felt kind of not different. It never bothered me being different to other people, by the way. Uh, but I also always felt like all my friends are playing soccer. They're all doing whatever. And I just felt that wasn't for me. And I kind of went into my old little world. And uh, I remember kind of primary school, I would have drawn stuff like the A-team, just in copy books and would have had all these stuff. And uh, I just kept at it. I suppose I get a bit of praise for it and I just keep going. Um, I do remember kind of like from third and fourth class in primary school, I do remember this kind of gap uh, happening. So what I'd say is kids are quite talented at that stage. There's loads of my friends were good at art and at that younger age. And I suppose it's kind of like fourth class or whatever. I felt this gap uh, increasing between myself and my friends. So look, what I'd say is there's friends of mine uh, that were drawing stuff and I'd cop, I, oh, they do something really good. And I go, oh, just I try and beat them and a little kind of competition between us or oh, that person's doing shadows there. Jess, I never thought of doing shadows or do you know what I mean? Things like that. And then I'd kind of, it was like a little competition that was going through myself and my group of friends. And I suppose from kind of four class on onwards in primary school, I found this kind of gap changing uh, where I was kind of doing that a bit more and my friends were kind of being left behind. Um, and... I have a clear, I, I actually said this in a recent thing that I did with a friend of mine. I had this thing in sixth class in primary school that I knew what I wanted at the end of prim, of the end of secondary school. Like I, I knew at 12 years of age what I wanted. I wanted to do animation. I wanted to go to art college. I wanted to do animation. And I knew that from sixth class in primary school. And that was going through. And that came from uh, seeing an article in the Sunday world with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles had a, the guys had a little walk cycle, a four or five step walk cycle of the Teenage Mutant Turtles, Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I copied that from that. I made my own characters and those, those positions and made them move in like notebooks and scrapbooks and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And there's another thing as well. My older brother was a big fan of 2000 AD. Uh, and one of the big things in 2000 AD was Judge Dredd. And I loved all that stuff. I loved that sci-fi. I loved all those films. And uh, I, I describe as well that Terminator 2 came out when I was in first class in secondary school. So when I was about 13, uh, really influential, uh, Terminator 2 came out. And Braveheart came out around that time, and Michael Collins came out around that time. Uh, these were like really influential on on me, and it was like that Hollywood was coming, uh, was calling. It, it was it was like you didn't have to go over to America to do this stuff, or you didn't have to go to Disneyland in in California. Like these things were happening around here and ever since then like true animation like I go into schools uh, workshops for kids now and I tell them all the stuff that's being made in Dublin Doc Mac Stuffins uh, Amazing World of Gumball and all these crazy kids animation TV shows that they watch every day and they don't realise they're made in Dublin um, or they're made by Irish creatives and uh, so that's that was kind of my secondary school kind of uh when you're when you're sitting there right you know what you want to do 12 years of age you have this you know i want to be an animator and that's your you know you've decided did you did you get in trouble in school did you get like from from 12 to 18 say with with this vision in mind you knew what you want to do did you get bored like how did you survive knowing because i mean career career did, you know, that didn't you know career advice probably didn't matter to you um you know maths maybe didn't matter to you you know other subjects maybe didn't matter when you were so you know tell, tell me about those few years yeah look that, that was a double-edged sword um yeah i suppose i knew i didn't need irish i didn't need maths so i kind of let those things slide look I, they wouldn't have been my uh, strength anyway I, I i loved irish by the way i loved learning the language i love learning words but you get into grammar and all that stuff i just couldn't handle that stuff you know um and writing essays and stuff like I, I loved kind of learning the words and kind of 
pigeon pigeon Irish if you like learn stuff but once it came to grammar and stuff I, I was just switching off uh, same with maths as well look once you get off to the, the basic stuff and you get into Pythagoras theorem and all this stuff I was just like switching off mm-hmm. you know <laughs> yeah I, I, I wasn't too bad to look about uh, the junior start and then I just like this is get, going over my head type of stuff yeah. uh, look I, I, I think it was a double-edged sword as in look I, I knew what I wanted to do and like I was confident in what I was doing and I went, went. I did my whole journey through and I had a really influential art teacher as well uh, who I'm still friends with actually uh, a guy called Kieran Bean and he was really influential because he actually encouraged me what I wanted to do and look there's the problem with art and particularly in, particularly in secondary school it's all based on a curriculum uh, so the teachers teach art to pass the exam and uh, there's so much more to art and, and this is there, I do tell people as well, there's, you could still have a career in animation or a career in filmmaking or whatever you want to do and not be good at this stuff because it's it's different. It's like that. There, there's so many different s- stuff to it. Like what I say to people, like you could be working, uh, doing colours, colours in comics and not being able to draw, but you could be doing colour theory and you just could be absolutely amazing at colour or you might not be good at doing life figure drawn, but you might be able to do background art. Or um, I have friends of mine who've gone on to do architecture and they found their way into gaming and stuff like that, through architecture. But that's like a completely different mindset. And um, to, to me even, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so look, it was like a double-edged sword. Look, I never really got in trouble. I did kind of scribble and doodle in my books. Uh, that, and that is a trait. When I talk to other creative kids, that is something. Look, it is a little bit boredom. It is escaping into your own world. And it is, like, I, I remember just doodling Batman all the time, <laughs> running across the page or jumping across and shooting hooks over at words. Yeah. And uh, I have to say, I, I was quite... It's quite a nerdy guy in school. Uh, like I, I was the guy that would have done the school newspaper. I was the guy that uh, organised all this stuff. And this is where all the other stuff is coming in. Yeah. You can see where you can see where I'm going with this. But I, I was the guy that did the, the school newsletter. I would have, uh, I would have done the teenage discos. I would have organised the teenage discos. I would have reviewed concerts in the magazines because that's what I love. I love music, I love film, I love art. I would have done all of those little reviews uh, and I would have went back into school. And when the newsletter, photocopy newsletter would come out in a few weeks, I was all over that stuff. Um, and there's a couple of friends of mine and I'm still friends with all those guys as well. We wouldn't have been friends in secondary school, but like it's this kind of kinship in putting stuff together. Um, and sadly, we actually lost one of uh, our guys through cancer there a few years ago as well. But uh, uh, a friend of our Adon's. But um, yeah, we would have been like a little kind of man getting this stuff together. And look, it was a thing as well. We used to get out of the odd class, odd few classes and stuff. Um, I would have been the kind of prefect uh, in school. So I would have like looked after the younger lads and all that sort of stuff. And I actually did a, a thing. And <laughs> It lasted, I did it for fifth year and sixth year, a little bit of sixth year, and I gave it over to another guy, and I think he got about two weeks of it, and I was shut down. Uh, but he actually used to run a lunchtime radio through the school intercom. Um, I used to pre-record songs on a tape deck, and I used to <laughs> introduce them, and uh, used, to pl- used to play through the tape deck. I used to, used to play the songs for about 15, 20 minutes over the school intercom and lunch breaks and stuff. So it was like, I had that stuff even in secondary school, you know. It's just um, interesting, because I'm, I'm going to ask you about technology and, and the role of technology. And it's, it's mad. You talk about evolution, you know, of, of the, the process and doodling and, and somebody, like, it's, it's amazing to hear the different layers that are involved. And, you know, we, we don't think of architecture as, I suppose, art in the sense that, you know, people see the result as a house. And it, 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 it's fascinating to scratch the surface and the layers. So to go from playing tapes, pre-recorded tapes, and, you know, uh, I remember rushing to get the song myself and press and record and play at the same time. And God forbid you missed the start of it. Um, but technology now, 
and where, where we're going. I mean, we, we have Metaverse, for example, and we, we can go into these other places with our avatars and become someone else. And it's, it's almost full circle, I think, that you know, when, when maybe you're a kid and you're going somewhere else, it's not conventional and you're seen as maybe the weird kid or the kid who's you know, a bit different or you know, wh whatever, whatever it is. But now we have this world coming around in terms of technology. We are avatars in a metaverse and that's the next, the next thing. And the technology and the journey even for you, maybe from Dunleary at the time, you know, doing the animation, that there was nothing happening in Dublin, and now all of these fantastic shows and, and, and creations are happening, you know, an hour, an hour up the road. What, what is your opinion, David, on, on the role of technology, maybe the future of the work that you do? Where, where is it going? Yeah, that's very interesting. So um, I suppose I'll just explain my kind of own, own stuff of it. And look, I, I'm, I'm kind of here in my 40s here, and I'm I do all this stuff as well and I see these kids like 14 and just blown me away like I, I have a niece at the minute that's so creative doing absolutely amazing stuff teaching her stuff teaching herself stuff off YouTube and all this stuff and doing all the digital pads and um, it's brilliant I really love it and uh, what I describe to people as well like I have more technology film making technology in a phone now and we had nearly in college um we we would have had line testers in college that would have been all uh, amiga uh pcs and stuff and, and i i was laughing at this actually another thing as well i did three years in college i did not own a pc uh in those three years so we the only my only experience of the internet was through uh the college and uh, I didn't even own a PC, uh, so I used to come home, write out my scripts from my animation, go down to my aunts who had a PC, uh, and type up my animation projects, put it on the floppy disk and come back in. And sometimes when I was under pressure or whatever, my aunt would actually <laughs> type up the stuff for me. Uh, uh, she was great. My aunt, uh, Dinger, Kathleen, she was great with that stuff. Uh, she, used to, she used to do a secretarialist course. She was like, here, get out of the way. <laughs> Done. thanks very much out the door you know uh, look it was a different world it was a different time like I'd say to people as well like we we were, it was all like landlines and like you'd go to college on a Monday morning Sunday night or Monday morning your parents will not know whether you're alive or dead until you arrive back and that's the truth like you know what I mean we had so much freedom, like compared to now, like, and uh, look, there's good and bad and then everything, but um, I used to describe as well, I used to bring home on a Thursday evening and you'd have to pre-arrange, look, I'll ring at seven o'clock on Thursday or what I used to have to do is I'd ring my grandparents who had, my granny had the phone, uh, so I would ring my grandmother. And she'd have to go up the road to tell my parents, here, David's gone on the phone, he's going to ring back in 15 minutes. And you literally hang around the payphone for 15 minutes, hoping no one else gets in in that meantime, which did happen as well. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just a different world. And look, I describe as well, you um, after a night out or whatever, and the clamoring for the phones to try to get a taxi home. And uh, I was saying to, as well, like, You'd arrange with your friends to go out on a Saturday night or whatever and say, you meet up at eight o'clock and if you were not there, they're gone. Tough. Like they'd have one or two drinks. Yeah. There could be a bus going to Newbridge, could be a bus going to Nace, could be going to Carlow, could be going to Port Leash. If you were not there at that time, look, they'll give you half an hour, but like, they won't give you an hour like if you and you won't find them so there's like there's been occasions where you go out the lads are gone you have like they're like no mobile phones you don't know where to get gone you couldn't follow them uh and then you end up drinking with your dad or finding your uncles or whatever and one of the pubs and having a few points there uh but that was just the time you know so look the uh, like saying as well like all the reference stuff like we have things like pinterest now i use all the time so i would pin um history stuff i stuff like uniforms and uh like what the black and hands look like and all the reference pictures and same with shackling i would have 
I would have Pinterest, all of those stuff. Great way of collecting. Like years ago, I would have had scrapbooks. I would have had uh, all that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, it's describing like um, years ago, you'd be doing comics or whatever, and you would look for a reference picture of a tank and you just wouldn't have it. You'd have to go to the library or you'd have to take oh, you'd see a picture in a tank in a magazine or a newspaper and you'd cut it out and you'd keep it because you might use it someday, you know. Uh, so now all that stuff is all digital. And look, if you want a reference of the tank now, you just pick up your phone and tap it into Google and it's there, you know. But back in the day, that wasn't there. And you'd have to research in libraries and stuff as are you, well. Are you dropping hints, David, there are black and tans? Are you dropping hints? Because I, I haven't seen the black and tans and I think the work you've done. Um, are, you, are you dropping hints about a project or <laughs> well i'd say to you dave you missed a the trick there because <laughs> uh, uh, there is one of the projects there called uh the stolen writer's revenge and the bad guys are black and tans oh uh, bad me bad me <laughs> uh but yeah i actually do have a project um unannounced to so give me an exclusive uh hopefully i'll get myself in trouble don't, don't get in trouble you don't have to go there i know i i think look it's 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 coming and hopefully by the time this goes to air uh the cover and stuff will be out but uh I, i'm working on a graphic novel on michael collins um and uh yeah i suppose the history team is something that's come through all of my work uh true mario and uh, just finding these characters, these real characters, and uh, I suppose I kind of found a, kind of a niche for myself as well. Um, as in, I kind of I like working the young adults kind of age group, that kind of eight to twelve. Um, I found I find that that's that Saturday morning cartoon from the eighties kind of vibe. Uh, that kind of teenage mutant turtle stuff is all coming into the fore, and that's kind of my my bag, if you like. Um, I, I find I'm working most of the, I think if I do younger stuff it, it's a lot harder and uh, the older stuff as well so I, I kind of find in, that's the stuff that just flows for me um, yeah so just uh, just this book now it's uh, it's not coming out till the autumn in October um, uh, the cover should reveal in the next few weeks so hopefully by the time this goes there it'll cover it out uh, and I'm working with my friend Mario Kerrigan. So Mario is the writer on this. Uh, this is Mar Mario's first uh, graphic novel. Um, and despite having done Shackleton and all the other stuff, this is an absolute beast of a project. Uh, Shackleton was 96 pages. This is actually 64, uh, but the work rate is different. Um, I suppose Shackleton, you had a, a set amount of characters and there was all those group of characters and it was just them going through the journey, whereas this is just bouncing back and forth, like the, the mansion house, the custom house, uh, the doll, the original doll, like all the characters, same in Devil Era, all those people all have to be researched and looked up, and um, you try to get a sense of all that stuff as well. And look, you, you try to try make your own character design version of it, and uh, yeah, kind of hardest, probably the hardest part is kind of, tying it all together or bring it all in and making it look like it's not from all those different pieces but um i kind of approach it the same as i think i, I approach the history stuff in the same way as i did with shackling as in there's these little key iconic pe people know michael collins but they know michael collins from i'd say about 10 15 different photographs uh key iconic images so I'm trying to tell and the rest of the story in between and flowing through. Um, but yeah, look, it's it's been a, it's been a battle itself. Like it's the the project was rejected a few times, and um, the original publisher of Shacklin has been sold to Gill Books, and uh, Gill Books don't do graphic novels. Uh, and so that was gone. Uh, so that avenue was gone. Um, and then I had to keep chasing a few uh, different projects, uh, different publishers, and a few of them didn't work. And you get this odd bit of a, uh, oh, we quite like that, but it's, it's not, we're not going to take it on now. Um, and that's the business side. Unfortunately, that's something you have to learn. Um, so it, it is a business and like they're not going to invest 
that amount of work, that amount of time and that much expense printing these books uh, unless the field are going to get a return. And I suppose when I'd, when I'd done shackling and stuff, I was able to go back and say, right, I have this book made on shackling. I was able to send that book to them. So you become less of a risk. You've done it before. Um, and the fact I've worked with Mario for a couple of years as well, uh, and we are a good team and we work well together. So that's a bonus as well. And yeah, so hopefully what, what I've realized is those kind of barriers get knocked down as in you're less of a risk. You're, you're, you're more business. You're more, if you have a better chance of uh, success uh, after time or if you've a proven record. And yeah, look, that's an animation, that's in filmmaking as well. So you'd see these people that have a bit of success getting more work, getting stuff. And if you're trying to get on that ladder, it's uh, it's hard, you know. It's and that's to be honest, that's why I kind of got out of filmmaking and got out of animation. It was just it, you can never like I had I had my own TV series in development, uh, and uh, we got actually beaten to the funding uh, by an Oscar nominated. Irish animation studio uh, and that was it and look it was, we were just torpedoed out of the water and said forget about it lads uh, we're going with these uh, good luck um, and, and that's just part of it and that's kind of but look I just from my own creative side I just keep going uh, just find different avenues um, I love music I love art I love film I love animation I love lots of the stuff that I loved when I was 15 uh, and I still get excited by Batman. I still get excited by uh, bits and pieces that come out and Star Wars and all that sort of stuff as well. So that's that's all part of it. And uh, yeah, just thankfully I got a got a chance to do a few things. And look, the the dream changes as well. Like I, I would have uh, I would have loved to do 2000 AD and all that Judge Dread and all that stuff. And look, that stuff doesn't hasn't happened. And uh, Maybe someday, but uh, it's not in the immediate future. I, f I found my niche, I found my happy medium, and I've, I'm bringing these historical figures to, to life to new audiences and stuff as well. So that's all cool, you know. I look forward to seeing that. Um, come here to me. Tell me Tell me where we can find you. Um, where, where can people see and buy, buy the work? And uh, yeah, tell us, tell us where, where you are. Yeah, so I have my own website, anything.ie. So it's A N I T H I N G. So it's animation things. So that's where that word came from. Uh, it was any A N I for animation as an A N Y. Uh, so that's where that kind of came in. And I would have I would have set myself up years ago as anything productions. I would have been self employed under that. And uh, I tried to do a studio at one stage. Would have tried to do it officially. Uh, and then as things change, it's kind of back to it. But that's where the website is. Uh, Anything Artist on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you will find the Michael Collins book on the Brian Press. Uh, look out for it. You'll see it in the next few weeks. So this is March now. Hopefully by the end of March, April, the book will be released out, out in the world and going for pre-sale and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, and then in June, we're coming back with Celticon. And so our Newbridge event is confirmed and just after this recording, I'm on a call later on, hopefully doing the Port Leash one. Uh, so hopefully, uh, so the Newbridge one is June the 6th, uh, June Bank Holiday in Newbridge, uh, June Fest. And the Port Leash one will hopefully be at the end of June uh, as part of the old four, fourth quarter festival. So that's that's the plans for that. Um, so hopefully that will come true in the next few weeks. Um, and yeah, just, just beyond that, I'm all the book stuff is all hidden away at the minute, uh, uh, but as the release date and stuff starts coming out, there will be a campaign. Uh, we will be releasing that into the wild, as I say. Uh, that's a scary thing. It's, uh, <laughs> it's but worth it, but it's all, it's, all, it's all worth it in the end. Ah yeah, look, it's there, and look, you you, you do these things, and you like I, I I describe stuff like you do these short stories, these eight page, four page things, and then you do these massive. So it's like it's like doing short films, and then doing the feature film, and um, and then you release it out, and then something like Mike Collins, he's so well known, so iconic, and uh, you hope you get the mix right, and people go easy, and uh, 
I've I've learned from Shacklin. Um, I got a few bad, not bad reviews, but a few comments, and I look at them and go, Do you know what, that person's actually right. <laughs> so sometimes it's not a, it's not all bad, you know. Um, I haven't had the onslaught. Uh, it's all been good, and I, 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 I do feel people are very positive. Like if you have a positive thing, people are positive behind you. And uh, look, I, I've fill my social media with friends and like-minded people and creatives like yourself, Dave, and the Power of Words Festival and uh, the Dunamay's Art Centre and uh, the Celticon community. And look, we're all a community. We're all friends and we're all trying to do the same thing and um, help the next people out. And look, we all like what he do. Like, there's no one I've no one go kind of slating uh, or big stuff, but, like, um, we'll see. It's... Uh, scary it's it's like you're putting stuff out in the public yeah it's, it's good, good. It's, it's, it's hard it's hard but it's good it's good we are coming on time sir so what i'd say is people need to check out anything.ie that's a-n-i-t a-n-i-t-h-i-n-g dot i-e to uh, keep up to date and up to speed with the antics uh david butler thank you very very much for joining us this morning thanks very much david And that's it for another week. Thanks for joining us this morning and do join us next time on Be Your Best You. Have a good week.